Section 9 of The Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen by Albert Hubbard. Section 9, Samuel Adams, Part 2. And so, there they convened on the 5th day of September, 1774, having met by appointment and walked over from the city tavern in a body. Forty-four men were present, not a large gathering, but they had come hundreds of miles, and several of them had been monks on the journey. They were a sturdy lot, and, madam, I think it would have been worthwhile to have looked in upon them. There were several coonskin caps in evidence, also lace and frills, and velvet brought from England, but plainness to severity was the rule. Few of these men had ever been away from their own colonies before. Few had ever met any members of the Congress save their own colleagues. They represented civilizations of very different degrees. Each stood a bit in awe of all the rest. Several of the colonies had been in conflict with the others. Meeting new men in those days, when even the stagecoach was a passing show worth going miles to see, was an event. There was awkwardness and nervousness on the swarthy faces, firm mouths twitched, and big bony hands sought for places of concealment. The meeting had been called for September 1st, but was postponed for five days, awaiting the arrival of belated delegates who had been detained by floods. Even then, delegates from North Carolina had not arrived, and Georgia not having thought it worthwhile to send any, eleven colonies only were represented. Each delegation naturally kept together, as men will who have a fighting history and a pioneer ancestry. It was a serious, solemn business, and these men were not given to levity in any event. When they were seated, there was a moment of silence so tense it could be heard. Every chance moment of a foot on the uncarpeted floor sent an echo through the room. The stillness was first broken by Mr. Lynch, of South Carolina, who arose and in a low, clear voice said, quote, There is a gentleman present who has presided with great dignity over a very respectable body and greatly to the advantage of America. Gentlemen, I move that the Honorable Peyton Randolph, one of the delegates from Virginia, be appointed to preside over this meeting. I doubt not it will be unanimous. End quote. It was so and a large man in powdered wig and scarlet coat arose, and carrying his gold-headed cane before him like a mace, walked to the platform without apology. The New Englanders in homespun looked at one another with trepidation on their features. The red coat was not assuring, but they kept their peace and breathed hard, praying that the enemy had not captured the convention through strategy. Mr. Randolph's first suggestion was not revolutionary. It was that a secretary be appointed. Again, Mr. Lynch arose and named Charles Thompson, quote, a gentleman of family, fortune, and character, end quote. This testimonial of family and fortune was not assuring to the plain Massachusetts men, but they said nothing and awaited developments. All were cautious as woodsmen, and the motion that the council be held behind closed doors was adopted. Every member then held up his right hand and made a solemn promise to divulge no part of the transactions, and Galloway of Pennsylvania promised with the rest, and straightaway each night informed the enemy of every move. Little was done that first day, but get acquainted by talking very cautiously and very politely. The next day a notable member had arrived, and in a front seat sat Richard Henry Lee, a man you would turn and look at in any company. Slender and dark, with a brilliant eye and a profile, and only one man in ten thousand has a profile, Lee was a gracious presence. His voice was gentle and flexible and luring, and there was a dignity and poise in his manner that made him easily the foremost orator of his time. Near him sat William Livingston of New Jersey, and John Jay, his son-in-law, the youngest man in the Congress, with a nose that denoted character and all his fame in the future. The Pennsylvanians were all together, grouped in one side. Duane of New York sat near them, quote, shy and squint-eyed, very sensible and very artful, end quote. 
wrote John Adams that night in his diary. Then over there sat Christopher Gadsden of South Carolina, who had preached independence for full ten years before this, and who, when he heard that the British soldiers had taken Boston, proposed to raise a troop at once and fight redcoats wherever found. But the British will burn our seaport towns if we antagonize them, some timid soul explained. Our towns are built of brick and wood. If they are burned, we can rebuild them, but liberty once gone is gone forever, he retorted. And the saying sounds well, even if it will not stand analysis. Back near the wall was a man who, when the assembly stood at morning prayers, showed a half head above his neighbors. His face was broad, and he, too, had a profile. His mouth was tightly closed, and during the first fourteen days of that Congress, he never opened it to utter a word, and after his long quiet, he broke the silence by saying, quote, Mr. President, I second the motion, end quote. Once in a passionate speech, Lynch turned to him and pointing his finger said, quote, There is a man who has not spoken here, but in the Virginia Assembly he made a most eloquent speech I ever heard. He said, I will raise a thousand men and arm and subsist them at my expense and march them to the relief of Boston, end quote. And then did the tall man, whose name was George Washington, blush like a schoolgirl. But in all that company, the men most noticed were the five members from Massachusetts. They were Bowden, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Gushing, and Robert Treat Payne. Massachusetts had thus far taken the lead in the struggle with England. A British army was encamped upon her soil, her chief city besieged, the port closed. Her sufferings had called this Congress into being, and to her delegates the members had come to listen. All recognized Samuel Adams as the chief man of the convention. His hand wrote the invitations and earnest requests to come. Galloway, writing to his friends, the enemy, said, quote, Samuel Adams eats little, drinks little, sleeps little, and thinks much. He is most decisive and indefatigable in the pursuit of his object. He is the man who, by his superior application, manages at once the faction in Philadelphia and the factions of New England. End quote. Yet Samuel Adams talked little at the convention. He allowed John Adams to state the case, but sat next to him, supplying memoranda, occasionally arising to make remarks or explanations in a purely conversational tone. But so earnest and impressive was his manner, so ably did he answer every argument and reply to every objection, that he thoroughly convinced a tall, angular, homely man by the name of Patrick Henry of the righteousness of his cause. Patrick Henry was pretty thoroughly convinced before, but the recital of Boston's case fired the Virginian, and he made the first and only real speech of the Congress. In burning words, he pictured all the colonies had suffered and endured, and by his matchless eloquence told in prophetic words of the glories yet to be. In his speech, he paid just tribute to the genius of Samuel Adams, declaring that the good that was to come from this, quote, first of an unending succession of Congresses, end quote, was owing to the work of Adams. And in the after years, Adams repaid the compliment by saying that if it had not been for the cementing power of Patrick Henry's eloquence, that first Congress would probably have ended in a futile wrangle. The South regarded in great degree the fight in Boston as Massachusetts' own. To make the entire thirteen colonies adopt the quarrel and back the colonial army in the vicinity of Boston was the only way to make the issue a success, and to unite the factions by choosing for a leader a Virginian aristocrat was a crowning stroke of diplomacy. John Hancock had succeeded Randolph as president of the Second Congress, and Virginia was inclined to be lukewarm when John Adams, in an impassioned speech, nominated Colonel George Washington as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. The nomination was seconded very quietly by Samuel Adams. It was a vote, and the South was committed to the cause of backing up Washington, and, incidentally, New England. The entire plan was probably the work of Samuel Adams, yet he gave the credit to John, while the credit of stoutly opposing it goes to John Hancock, who, being presiding officer, worked at a disadvantage. But Adams had a way of reducing opposition to the minimum. He kept out of sight and furthered his ends by pushing this man or that to the front at the right time to make the plea. 
he was a master in that fine art of managing men and never letting them know they are managed by keeping behind the heiress he accomplished purposes that a leader never can who allows his personality to be in continual evidence for personality repels as well as attracts and the man too much before the public is sure to be undone eventually adams knew that the power of pericles lay largely in the fact that he was never seen upon but a single street of athens and that but once a year the complete writings of adams have recently been collected and published one marvels that such valuable material has not before been printed and given to the public for the literary style and perspicuity shown are most inspiring and the value of the data cannot be gainsaid no one ever accused adams of being a muddy thinker you grant his premises and you are bound to accept his conclusions he leaves no loopholes for escape the following words used by chatham refer to documents in which adams took a prominent part in preparing Quote, when your lordships look at the papers transmitted us from america when you consider their decency firmness and wisdom you cannot but respect their cause and wish to make it your own for myself i must avow that in all my reading and i have read thucydides and have studied and admired the master statesmen of the world for solidity of reason force of sagacity and wisdom of conclusion under a complication of difficult circumstances no body of men can stand in preference to the general congress of philadelphia the histories of greece and rome give us nothing like it and all attempts to impress servitude on such a mighty continental people must be in vain End quote. in the life of adams there was no soft sentiment nor romantic vagaries quote, he is a puritan in all the word implies and the unbending fanatic of independence End quote. wrote gage and the description fits he was twice married our knowledge of his first wife is very slight but his second wife elizabeth wells daughter of an english merchant was a capable woman of brave good sense she adopted her husband's political views and with true womanly devotion let her old kinsman slide and during the dark hours of the war bore deprivation without repining adam's home life was simple to the verge of hardship all through life he was on the ragged edge financially and in his latter years he was for the first time relieved from pressing obligations by an afflicting event the death of his only son who was a surgeon in washington's army the money paid to the son by the government for his services gave the father the only financial competency he ever knew two daughters survived him but with him died the name john adams survived samuel for twenty-three years he lived to see quote, the great american experiment end quote, as mr ruskin had been pleased to call a country on a firm basis constantly growing stronger and stronger he lived to realize that the sanguine prophecies made by samuel were working themselves out in very truth the grave of samuel adams is viewed by more people than that of any other american patriot in the old granary burying ground in the very center of boston on tremont street there were travel congests and two living streams meet all day long you look through the iron fence so slender that it scarce impedes the view and not twenty feet from the curb is a simple metal disc set on an iron rod driven into the ground and on it this inscription quote, this marks the grave of samuel adams end quote. for many years the grave was unmarked and the disc that now denotes it was only recently placed in position by the sons of the american revolution but the place of samuel adams on the pages of history is secure upon the times in which he lived he exercised a profound influence and he who influences the times in which he lives has influenced all the times that come after he has left his impress on eternity end of section nine Section 10 of Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Little Journeys to the Homes of American Statesmen by Albert Hubbard. Section 10, Part 1, 
john hancock boston september thirtieth seventeen sixty five gent since by last i have received your favor by captain holm who has arrived here with the most disagreeable commodity say stamps that were imported into this country and what if carried into execution will entirely stagnate trade here for it is universally determined here never to submit to it and the principal merchants here will by no means carry on business under a stamp we are in the utmost confusion here and shall be more so after the first of november and nothing but the repeal of the act will righten the consequence of its taking place here will be bad and attended with many troubles and i believe may say more fatal to you than us i dread the event extract from hancock's letter book long ago when society was young learning was centered in one man in each community and that man was the priest it was the priest who was sent for in every emergency of life he taught the young prescribed for the sick advised those who were in trouble and when human help was vain and man had done his all this priest knelt at the bedside of the dying and invoked a power with whom it was believed he had influence the so-called learned professions are only another example of the division of labor we usually say that there are three learned professions theology medicine and law as to which is the greatest is a much mooted question and has caused too many family feuds for me to attempt to decide it and so i evade the issue and say there is a fourth profession that is only allowed to be called so by grace but which in my mind is greater than them all the profession of teacher i can conceive of a condition of society so high and excellent that it has no use for either doctor lawyer or preacher but the teacher would still be needed ignorance and sin supply the three learned professions their excuse for being but the teacher's work is to develop the germ of wisdom that is in every soul and now each of these professions has divided up like monads into many heads in medicine we have as many specialists as there are organs of the body the lawyer who advises you in a copyright or patent cause knows nothing about admiralty and as they tell us a man who pleads his own case has a fool for a client so does the insurance lawyer who is retained to foreclose a mortgage in all prosperous city churches the preacher who attracts the crowd in the morning allows apprentice to preach to the young folks in the evening he does not make pastoral calls and the curate who reads the service at funerals is never called upon to perform a marriage ceremony except in a case of charity likewise the teacher's profession has its specialists the man who teaches greek well cannot write good english the man who teaches composition is baffled and perplexed by long division and the teacher who delights in trigonometry pooh-poohs a kindergartner just where this evolutionary dividing and subdividing of social cells will land the race no man can say but that a specialist is a dangerous man is sure he is a buzzsaw with which wise men never monkey a surgeon who has operated for appendicitis five times successfully is above all to be avoided i once knew a man with lung trouble who inadvertently strayed into an oculist's and was looked over and sent away with an order on an optician and should you through error stray into the office of a nose and throat specialist and ask him to treat you for varicose veins he would probably do so by nasal douche even now a specialist in theology will lead us if he can a merry ignis fatuus chase and land us in a morass the only thing that saved the priest in days agone was the fact that he had so many duties to perform that he exercised all his mental muscles and thus attained a degree of all roundness which is not possible to the specialist even then there were not lacking men who found time to devote to specialties bishop georgius ambrosius for instance who in the fifteenth century produced a learned work 
proving that women have no souls and a like book was written at nashville tennessee in eighteen hundred fifty nine by the rev hubert parsons of the methodist episcopal church south showing that negroes were in a like predicament but in a more notable instance of the danger of a specialty is the rev cotton mather who investigated the subject of witchcraft and issued a modest brochure incorporating his views on the subject he succeeded in convincing at least one man of its verity and that man was himself and thus immortality was given to the town of salem which otherwise would have no claim on us for remembrance save that hawthorne was once a clerk in its customs house a very slight study of colonial history will show any student that for two centuries the ministers in new england occupied very much the same position in society that the priests did during the middle ages as the monks kept learning from dying off the face of the earth so did the ministers of the new world preserve culture from passing into forgetfulness very seldom indeed were books to be found in a community except at the ministers and during the seventeenth century and well into the eighteenth he combined in himself the offices of doctor lawyer preacher and teacher mr lowell has said i cannot remember when there was not one or more students in my father's household and others still who came at regular intervals to recite and this was the usual custom it was the minister who fitted boys for college and no youth was ever sent away to school until he had been drilled by the local clergyman and it must further be noted that genealogical tables show that very nearly all of the eminent men of new england were sons of ministers or of an ancestry where ministers names are seen at frequent intervals as an intellectual and moral force the minister has now but a rudiment of the power he once exercised the tendency to specialize all art and all knowledge has to a degree shorn him of his strength and to such an extent is this true that within forty years it has passed into a common proverb that the sons of clergymen are rascals whereas in colonial days the highest recommendation a youth could carry was that he was the son of a minister the rev john hancock grandfather of john hancock the patriot was for more than half a century the minister of lexington massachusetts i say the minister because there was only one the keen competition of sect that establishes half a dozen preachers in a small community is a very modern innovation john hancock bishop of lexington was a man of pronounced personality as is plainly seen in his portrait in the boston museum of fine arts they say he ruled the town with a rod of iron and when the young men who adorned the front steps of the meeting-house during service grew disorderly he stopped in his prayer and going outside soundly cuffed the ears of the first delinquent he could lay hands upon in his clay there was a dash of facetiousness that saved him from excess supplying a useful check to his zeal for zeal uncurbed is very bad he was a wise and beneficent dictator and government under such one cannot be improved upon his manner was gracious frank and open and such was the specific gravity of his nature that his words carried weight and his wish was sufficient the house where this fine old autocrat lived and reigned is standing in lexington now when you walk out through cambridge and arlington on your way to concord following the road the british took on their way out to concord you will pass by it it is a good place to stop and rest you will know the place by the tablet in front on which is the legend here john hancock and samuel adams were sleeping on the night of the eighteenth of april seventeen hundred seventy five when aroused by paul revere the rev jonas clark owned the house after the rev john hancock and the ministries of those two men and their occupancy of the house cover one hundred years and five years more here the thirteen children of jonas clark were born and all lived to be old men and women 
when you call there i hope you will be treated with the same gentle courtesy that i met if you delay not your visit too long you will see a fine motherly woman with white sausage curls and a high back comb wearing a check dress and felt slippers and she will tell you that she is over eighty and that when her mother was a little girl she once sat on governor hancock's knee and he showed her the works in his watch and then as you go away you will think again of what the old lady has just told you and as you look back for a parting glance at the house standing firm and solemn in its rusty gray dignity you will doff your hat to it and mayhap murmur the days of man on earth they are but as a passing shadow here john hancock and samuel adams were sleeping when aroused by paul revere merchant prince and agitator horse and rider where are you now and is your sleep disturbed by dreams of british redcoats or hissing flintlocks phantom british warships may lie at their moorings swinging wide on the unforgetting tide lanterns may hang high in the belfry of the old north church tower hurried knocks and calls of defiance and hoof-beats of fast galloping steed may echo and echo again borne on the night wind of the dim past but you heed them not the rev john hancock of lexington had two sons john hancock number two became pastor of the church of the north precinct of the town of braintree which afterwards was to be the town of quincy the nearest neighbor to the village preacher was john adams shoemaker and farmer each sunday in the amen corner of the rev john hancock's meeting-house was mustered the well-washed and combed brood of mr and mrs adams now this john adams had a son whom the rev john hancock baptized also named john two years older than john the son of the preacher and young john adams and john hancock number three used to fish and swim together and go nutting and set traps for squirrels and help each other in fractions and then they would climb trees and wrestle and sometimes fight in the fights they say john hancock used to get the better of his antagonist but as an exploiter of fractions john adams was more than his equal the parents of john adams were industrious and savin the little farm prospered for boston supplied a goodly market and weekly trips were made there in a one-horse cart often piloted by young john with the minister's boy for ballast the adams family had ambitions for their son john he was to go to harvard and be educated and be a minister and preach at braintree or weymouth or perhaps even boston in the meantime the rev john hancock had died and the widowed mother was not able to give her boy a college education times were hard but the lad's uncle thomas hancock a prosperous merchant of boston took quite an interest in young john and it occurred to him to adopt the fatherless boy legally as his own the mother demurred but after some months decided that it was best so for when twenty-one he would be her boy just as much and as truly as if his uncle had not adopted him and so the rich uncle took him and rigged him out with a deal finer clothing than he had ever before worn and sent him to the latin school and afterward over to cambridge with silver jingling in his pocket prosperity is a severe handicap to youth not very many grown men can stand it but beyond a needless display of velvet coats and frilled shirts the young man stood the test and got through harvard in point of scholarship he did not stand so high as john adams and between the lads there grew a small but well-defined gulf as is but natural between homespun and broadcloth still the gulf was not impassable for over it friendly favors were occasionally passed john hancock's mother wanted him to be a preacher but uncle thomas would not listen to it the youth must be taught to be a merchant so he could be the ready helper and then the successor of his foster father graduating at the early age of seventeen john hancock at once went to work in his uncle's counting-house in boston he was a fine tall fellow with dash and spirit 
and seemed to show considerable aptitude for the work the business prospered and uncle thomas was very proud of his handsome ward who was quite in demand at parties and balls and in a general social way while the uncle could not dance a minuet to save him not needing the young man very badly around the store the uncle sent him to europe to complete his education by travel he went with the retiring governor Pownall, whose taste for social enjoyment was very much in accord with his own in england he attended the funeral of george the second and saw the coronation of george the third little thinking the while that he would some day make violent efforts to snatch from that crown its brightest jewel when young hancock was twenty-seven the uncle died and left to him his entire fortune of three hundred fifty thousand dollars it made him one of the very richest men in the colony for at that time there was not a man in massachusetts worth half a million dollars the jingling silver in his pocket when sent to harvard had severely tested his moral fibre but this great fortune came near smothering all his native common sense if a man makes his money himself he stands a certain chance of growing as the pile grows there is little doubt as to the soundness of emerson's epigram that what you put into his chest you take out of the man more than this when a man gradually accumulates wealth it attracts little attention so the mob that follows the newly rich never really gets on to the scent and besides that the man who makes his own fortune always stands ready to repel boarders there may be young men of twenty-seven who are men grown and no doubt every man of twenty-seven is very sure that he is one of these but the thought that man is mortal never occurs to either men or women until they are past thirty the blood is warm conquest lies before and to seize the world by the tail and snap its head off seems both easy and desirable the promoters the flatterers and friends until then unknown flocked to hancock and condoled with him on the death of his uncle some wanted small loans to tide over temporary emergencies others had business ventures in hand whereby john hancock could double his wealth very shortly still others spoke of wealth being a trust and to use money to help your fellow men and thus to secure the gratitude of many was the proper thing the unselfishness of the latter suggestion appealed to hancock to be the friend of humanity to assist others this is the highest ambition to which a man can aspire and of course if one is pointed out on the street as the good mr hancock it cannot be helped it is the penalty of well-doing so in order to give work to many and to promote the interests of boston a thriving city of fifteen thousand inhabitants for all good men wished to build up the place in which they live john hancock was induced to embark in shipbuilding he also owned several ships of his own which traded with london and the west indies and was part owner of others but he publicly explained that he did not care to make money for himself his desire was to give employment to the worthy poor and to enhance the good of boston the aristocratic company of militia known as the governor's guard had been fitted out with new uniforms and arms by the generous hancock and he had been chosen commanding officer with rank of colonel he drilled with the crack company and studied the manual much more diligently than he had ever his bible hancock lived in the mansion inherited from his uncle on beacon street facing the common there was a chariot and six horses for state occasions much fine furniture from over the sea elegant clothes that the puritans called gaudy apparel and at the dinners the wine flowed freely and cards dancing and music filled many a night the puritan neighbors were shocked and held up their hands in horror to think that the son of a minister should so affront the staid and sober customs of his ancestors still others said why that's what a rich man should do spend his money of course hancock is the benefactor of his kind just see how many people he employs the town was all agog and hancock was easily boston's first citizen 
but in his time of prosperity he did not forget his old friends he sent for them to come and make merry with him and among the first in his good offices was john adams the rising young lawyer of braintree john adams had found clients scarce and those he had poor pay but when he became the trusted legal adviser of john hancock things took a turn and prosperity came that way the wine and cards and dinners hadn't much attraction for him but still there were no conscientious scruples in the way he patted john hancock on the back assured him that he was the people looked after his interests loyally and extracted goodly fees for services performed end of part one section ten section eleven of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard part two section eleven at the home of adams at braintree hancock had met a quiet taciturn individual by the name of samuel adams this man he had long known in a casual way but had never been able really to make his acquaintance he was fifteen years older than hancock and by his quiet dignity and self-possession made quite an impression on the young man so now that prosperity had smiled hancock invited him to his house but the quiet man was an ascetic and neither played cards drank wine nor danced and so declined with thanks but not long after he requested a small loan from the merchant prince and asked it as though it were his right and so he got it his manner was in such opposition to the flatterers and those who crawled and whined and begged that hancock was pleased with the man samuel adams had declined hancock's social favors and yet in asking for a loan showed his friendliness samuel adams was a politician and had long taken an active part in the town meetings in fact to get a measure through it was well to have samuel adams at your side he was clear-headed astute and knew the human heart yet he talked but little and the convivial ways of the small politician were far from him but in the fine art that can manage men and never let them know they are managed he was a past master tucked in his sleeve no doubt was a degree of pride in his power but the stoic quality in his nature never allowed him to break into laughter when he considered how he led men by the nose in boston and its vicinity samuel adams was not highly regarded and outside of boston at forty years of age he was positively unknown the neighbors regarded him as a harmless fanatic sane on most subjects but possessed of a buzzing bee in his bonnet to the effect that the colonies should be separated from their protector england samuel adams neglected his business and kept up a fusillade of articles in the newspapers on various political subjects and men who do this are regarded everywhere as queer a professional newspaper writer never takes his calling seriously it is business he writes to please his employer or if he owns the paper himself he still writes to please his employer that is to say the public journalism thy name is pander the man who comes up the stairway furtively with the manuscript he wants printed is in dead earnest and he has excited the ridicule wrath or pity of editors for three hundred years such a one was samuel adams his wife did her own work and the grocer with bills in his hand often grew red in the face and knocked in vain and yet the keen intellect of samuel adams was not a thing to smile at any man who stood before him face to face felt the power of the man and acknowledged it there and then as we always do when we stand in the presence of a strong individuality and this inward acknowledgment of worth was instinctively made by john hancock the biggest man in all boston town john hancock through his genial 
glowing personality and his lavish spending of money was very popular he was being fed on flattery and the more a man gets of flattery once the taste is acquired the more he craves it is like the mad thirst for liquor or the romaiki habit john hancock was getting attention and he wanted more he had been chosen selectman to fill the place that his uncle had occupied and when samuel adams accidentally dropped a remark that good men were needed in the general court john hancock agreed with him he was named for the office and with samuel adams help was easily elected not long after this the sloop liberty was seized by the government officials for violation of the revenue laws the craft was owned by john hancock and had surreptitiously landed a cargo of wine without paying duty when the ship of boston's chief citizen was seized by the bumptious gilt-braided british officials there was a merry uproar all the men in the shipyards quit work and the caulkers club of which samuel adams was secretary passed hot resolutions and revolutionary preambles and eulogies of john hancock who was doing so much for boston in fact there was a riot and three regiments of british troops were ordered to boston and this was the very first step on the part of england to enforce her authority by arms in america the troops were in the town to preserve order but the mob would not disperse upon the soldiers they heaped every indignity and insult they dared them to shoot and with clubs and stones drove the soldiers before them at last the troops made a stand and in order to save themselves from absolute rout fired a volley five men fell dead and the mob dispersed this was the so-called boston massacre pinkerton guards would blush at bagging so small a game with a volley they have done better again and again at pittsburgh pottsville and chicago the riot was quelled and out of the scrimmage various suits were instigated by the crown against john hancock in the court of admiralty the claims against him amounted to over three hundred thousand dollars and the charge was that he had long been evading the revenue laws john adams was his attorney with samuel adams as counsel and vigorous efforts for prosecution and defense were being made if the crown were successful the suits would confiscate the entire hancock estate matters were getting in a serious way witnesses were summoned but the trial was staved off from time to time hancock had refused to follow samuel adams lead in the controversy with governor hutchinson as to the right to convene the general court the report was that john hancock was growing lukewarm and siding with the tories a year had passed since the massacre had occurred and the agitators proposed to commemorate the day colonel hancock had appeared in many prominent parts but never as an orator why not show the town what you can do someone said so john hancock was invited to deliver the oration he did so to an immense concourse the address was read from the written page it overflowed with wisdom and patriotism and the earnestness and eloquence of the well-rounded periods was the talk of the town the knowing ones went around corners and roared with laughter but samuel adams said not a word the charge was everywhere made by the captious and bickering that the speech was written by another and that moreover john hancock had not even a very firm hold on its import it was the one speech of his life anyway it so angered general gage that he removed colonel hancock from his command of the cadets an order was out for hancock's arrest and he and samuel adams were in hiding the british troops marched out to lexington to capture them but paul revere was two hours ahead and when the redcoats arrived the birds had flown then came the expulsion of the british the closing of all courts the admiralty included the merchant prince breathed easier and that was the last of the crown versus john hancock throughout the months that had gone before when the hancock mansion was gay with floral decorations and servants in livery stood at the door with silver trays and the dancing hall was bright with mirth and music samuel adams had quietly been working his bureau of correspondence to the end that the thirteen colonies of america 
should come together in convention chief mover of the plan and the one man in massachusetts who was giving all his time to it he dictated whom massachusetts should send as delegates this delegation as we know included john hancock john adams and samuel adams himself from the danger of lexington hancock and adams made their way to philadelphia to attend the second congress at that time the rich men of new england were hurriedly making their way into the english fold some thought that the mother country had been harsh but still england had only acted within her right and she was well able to back up this authority she had regiment upon regiment of trained fighting men warships and money to build more the colonies had no army no ships no capital only those who have nothing to lose can afford to resist lawful authority back into the fold they went penitent and under their breath cursing the bull-headed men who insisted on plunging the country into red war out in the cold world stood john hancock alone save for bowden among the aristocrats of new england the british would confiscate his property his splendid house all would be gone it will all be gone anyway calmly suggested samuel adams you know those suits against you in the admiralty court yes yes and if we can unite these thirteen colonies an army can be raised and we can separate ourselves entire in which case there will be glory for somebody john hancock the rich the ambitious the pleasure-loving had burned his bridges he was in the hands of samuel adams and his infamy was one with this man who was a professional agitator and who had nothing to lose general gage had made an offer of pardon to all all save two men samuel adams and john hancock back into the fold tumbled the tories but against john hancock the gates were barred john adams attorney of the hancock estate rubbed his chin and decided to stand by the ship sink or swim survive or perish down in his heart samuel adams grimly smiled but on his cold pale face there was no sign the british held boston secure and in the splendid mansion of hancock lived the rebel lord percy england's pet the furniture plate and keeping of the place was quite to his liking hancock's ambitions grew as the days went by the fight was on his property was in the hands of the british and a price was upon his head he too now had nothing to lose if england could be whipped he would get his property back and the honors of victory would be his beside ambition grew apace he studied the manual of arms as never before and made himself familiar with the lives of caesar and alexander at harvard he had read the anabasis on compulsion but now he read it with zest the second congress was a congress of action the first had been one merely of conference a presiding officer was required and samuel adams quietly pushed his man to the front he let it be known that hancock was the richest man in new england perhaps in america and a power in every emergency john hancock was given the office of presiding officer the place of honor the thought never occurred to him that the man on the floor is the man who acts and the individual in the chair is only a referee an onlooker of the contest when a man is chosen to preside he is safely out of the way and no one knew this better than that clear-headed man wise as a serpent samuel adams hancock was intent on being chosen commander of the continental army the war was in massachusetts her principal port closed all business at a standstill hancock was a soldier and was moreover the chief citizen of massachusetts the command should go to him samuel adams knew this could never be to hold the southern colonies and give the cause a show of reason before the world an aristocrat with something to lose and without a personal grievance must be chosen and the man must be from the south to get hancock in a position where his mouth would be stopped he was placed in the chair it was a master move colonel george washington was already a hero he had fought valiantly for england his hands were clean while hancock was openly called a smuggler 
washington was nominated by john adams the motion was seconded by samuel adams hancock turned first red and then deathly pale he grasped the arms of his chair with both hands and put the question it was unanimous hancock's fame seems to rest on the fact that he was presiding officer of the congress that passed the declaration of independence and therefore its first signer and without consideration for cost of ink and paper wrote his name in poster letters when you look upon the declaration the first thing you see is the signature of john hancock and you recall his remark i guess king george can read that without spectacles the whole action was melodramatic and although a bold signature has ever been said to betoken a bold heart it has yet to be demonstrated that boys who whistle going through the woods are indifferent to danger conscious weakness takes strong attitudes says delsart the strength of hancock's signature was an affectation quite in keeping with his habit of riding about boston in a coach and six with outriders in uniform and servants in livery when hancock wrote to washington asking for an appointment in the army the wise and far-seeing chief replied with gentle words of praise concerning colonel hancock's record and wound up by saying that he regretted there was no place at his disposal worthy of colonel hancock's qualifications well did he know that hancock was not quite patriot enough to fill a lowly rank the part that hancock played in the eight years of war was inconspicuous however there was little spirit of revenge in his character he sometimes scolded but he did not hate he never allowed personal animosities to make him waver in his loyalty to independence in fact with a price upon his head but one course was open to him just before washington was inaugurated president he visited boston and a curious struggle took place between him and hancock who was governor it was all a question of etiquette which should make the first call each side played a waiting game and at last hancock's gout came in as an excellent excuse and the country was saved in one of his letters hancock says the entire genteel portion of the town was invited to my house while on the sidewalk i had a cask of madeira for the common people his repeated re-election as governor proves his popularity through lavish expenditure his fortune was much reduced and for many years he was sorely pressed for funds his means being tied up in unproductive ways his last triumph as governor was to send a special message to the legislature informing that body that a company of aliens and foreigners have entered the state and the metropolis of government and under advertisements insulting to all good men and ladies have been pleased to invite them to attend certain stage plays interludes and theatrical entertainments under the style and appellation of moral lectures all of which must be put a stop to to once and the rogues and varlets punished a few days after this the aliens and foreigners gave a presentation of sheridan's school for scandal in the midst of the performance the sheriff and a posse made a rush upon the stage and bagged all the offenders when their trial came on the next day the varlets and vagrams had secured high-level talent to defend them one of which counsel was harrison gray otis the actors were discharged on the slim technicality that the warrants of arrest had not been properly verified however the theatre was closed but the common people made such an unseemly howl about rights and all that that the legislature made haste to repeal the law which provided that play actors should be flogged hancock defaulted in his stewardship as treasurer of harvard college and only escaped arrest for embezzlement through the fact that he was governor of the state and no process could be served upon him after his death his estate paid nine years simple interest on his deficit and ten years thereafter the principal was paid his widow married captain scott who was long in hancock's employ as master of a brig and we find the worthy caption proudly exclaiming i have embarked on the sea of matrimony 
and am now at the helm of the hancock mansion no biography of governor hancock has ever been written the record of his life flutters only in newspaper paragraphs letters and chance mention in various diaries hancock did not live to see john adams president worn by worry and grown old before his time he died at the early age of fifty-six of a combination of gout and that unplebeian complaint we now term bright's disease thirty-three years after hail old john adams down at quincy spoke of him as a clever fellow a bit spoiled by a legacy whom i used to know in my younger days he left no descendants and his heirs were too intent on being in at the death to care for his memory they neither preserved the data of his life nor over his grave placed a headstone the monument that now marks his resting place was recently erected by the state of massachusetts he was buried in the old granary burying ground on tremont street and only a step from his grave sleeps his friend samuel adams end of section eleven section twelve of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by s k edison new jersey little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard section twelve john quincy adams part one to the guidance of the legislative councils to the assistance of the executive and subordinate departments to the friendly cooperation of the respective state governments to the candid and liberal support of the people so far as it may be deserved by honest industry and zeal i shall look for whatever success may attend my public service and knowing that quote, except the lord keep the city the watchman waketh in vain end quote, with fervent supplications for his favor to his overruling providence i commit with humble but fearless confidence my own fate and the future destinies of my country inaugural address nine miles south of boston just a little back from the escalloped shores of old ocean lies the village of braintree it is on the plymouth post road being one of that string of settlements built a few miles apart for better protection that lined the sea boston being crowded and plymouth full to overflowing the home seekers spread out north and south in sixteen hundred twenty when the first cabin was built at braintree land that was not in sight of the coast had actually no value back a mile all was a howling wilderness with trails made by wild beasts or savage men as wild these paths led through tangles of fallen trees and tumbled rocks beneath dark overhanging pines where winter's snows melted not till midsummer and the sun's rays were strange and alien men who sought to traverse these ways had to crouch and crawl or climb through them no horse or ox or beast of burden had carried its load but up from the sea the ground rose gradually for a mile and along this slope that faced the tide wind and storm had partly cleared the ground and on the hillsides our forefathers made their homes the houses were built facing either the east or the south this persistence to face either the sun or the sea shows a last strange rudiment of paganism making queer angles now that surveyors have come with gunter's chain and transit laying out streets and doing the work a mile out north of braintree on the boston road came in sixteen hundred twenty five one captain wollaston a merry white and thirty boon companions all of whom probably left england for england's good they were in search of gold and pelf and all were agreed on one point they were quite too good to do any hard work the camp was called mount wollaston or the merry mound our gallant gentlemen cultivated the friendship of the indians in the hope that they would reveal the caves and caverns where the gold grew lush and nuggets cumbered the way and the indians liking the drink they offered brought them meal and corn and furs and so the thirty set up a maypole adorned with buck's horns and drank and feasted and danced like fairies of furies the live-long day or night 
So scandalously did these exiled lords behave that good folks made a wide circuit round to avoid their camp. Preaching had been in vain, and prayers for the conversion of the wretches remained unanswered. So the neighbors held a convention and decided to send Captain Miles Standish with a posse to teach the merry men manners. Standish appeared among the Bacchanalians one morning, perfectly sober, and they were not. He arrested the captain and bade the others be gone. The leader was shipped back to England with compliments and regrets, and the thirty scattered. This was the first move in that quarter in favor of local option. Six years later, the land thereabouts was granted and apportioned out to Reverend John Wilson, William Coddington, Edward Quincy, James Penniman, Moses Payne, and Francis Elliot. And these men and their families built houses and founded, quote, the North Precinct of the town of Braintree, end quote. Between the North Precinct and the South Precinct, there was continual rivalry. Boys who were caught over the deadline, which was marked by Deacon Penniman's house, had to fight. Thus things continued until 1792, when one John Adams was Vice President of the United States. Now, this John Adams, lawyer, was a son of John Adams, honest farmer and codwainer, who had bought the Penniman homestead, and whose progenitor, Henry Adams, had moved there in 1636. John Adams, Vice President, afterwards President, was born there in the Penniman House, and was regarded as a neutral, although he had been thrashed by boys both from the North and from the South Precinct. But at the last, there is no such thing as neutrality. John Adams sided with the boys from the North Precinct, and now that he was in power, it occurred to him, having had a little experience in the revolutionary line, that for the North Precinct to secede from the great town of Braintree would be but proper and right. The North Precinct had six stores that sold W.I. goods, and a tavern that sold W.E.T. goods, and it should have a post office of its own. So John Adams suggested the matter to Richard Cranch, who was his brother-in-law and near neighbor. Cranch agitated the matter, and the new town, which was the old, was incorporated. They called it Quincy, probably because Abigail, John's wife, insisted upon it. She had named her eldest boy Quincy in honor of her grandfather, whose father's name was Quincy, and who had relatives who spelled it de Quincy, one of which tribe was an opium eater. Now, when Abigail made a suggestion, John usually heeded it for Abigail was as wise as she was good, and John well knew that his success in life had come largely from the help, counsel, and inspiration vouchsafed to him by this splendid woman. And the man who will not let a woman have her way in all such small matters as naming of babies or towns is not much of a man. So the town was named Quincy, and brother-in-law Cranch was appointed its first postmaster. Shortly after, the Boston Sentinel contained a sarcastic article over the signature, quote, old subscriber, end quote, concerning the distribution of official patronage among kinsmen, and the Elliots and the Everetts gossiped over their back fences. At this time, Abigail lived in the cottage there on the Plymouth Road, halfway between Braintree and Quincy, but she got her mail at Quincy. The Adams cottage is there now, and the next time you are in Boston, you had better go out and see it, just as June and I did, one bright October day. June has lived within an hour's ride of the Adams' home all her blessed thirty-two sunshiny summers. She also boasts a Mayflower ancestry, with, however, a slight infusion of Castle Garden, like myself, to give firmness of fibre, and yet she had never been to Quincy. The John and Abigail Cottage was built in 1716, so says a truthful brick found in the quaint old chimney. Deacon Penniman built this house for his son, and it faces the sea, although the older Penniman house faces the south. John Adams was born in the older house, but when he used to go to Weymouth every Wednesday and Saturday evening to see Abigail Smith, the minister's daughter, his father, the worthy shoemaker, told him that when he got married, he could have the other house for himself. John was a bright young lawyer then, a graduate of Harvard, where he had been sent in hopes that he would become a minister, for one half of the students then at Harvard were embryo preachers. But John did not take to theology. 
he had witnessed ecclesiastical tennis and theological pitch and toss and braintree that had nearly split the town and he decided on the law one thing sure he could not work he was not strong enough for that everybody said so and right here seems a good place to call attention to the fact that weak men like those who are threatened live long john adams letters to his wife reveal a very frequent reference to liver complaint lung trouble and that tired feeling yet he lived to be ninety-two the reverend mr smith did not at first favor the idea of his daughter abigail marrying john adams the adams family were only farmers and shoemakers when it rained while the smiths had aristocracy on their side he said lawyers were men who got bad folks out of trouble and good folks in but abigail said that this lawyer was different and as mr smith saw it was a love match and such things being difficult to combat successfully he decided he would do the next best thing give the young couple his blessing yet the neighbors were quite scandalized to think that their pastor's daughter should hold converse over the gate with a lawyer and they let the clergyman know it as neighbors then did and sometimes do now then did the reverend mr smith announce that he would preach a sermon on the sin of meddling with other folks business as his text he took the passage from luke seventh chapter thirty-third verse quote, for john came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and ye say he hath a devil end quote. the neighbors saw the point for a short time before when the eldest daughter mary had married richard cranch the man who was to achieve a post office the community had entered a protest and the reverend mr smith had preached from luke tenth chapter forty second verse quote, and mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her end quote. so there now and john and abigail were married one evening at early candlelight in the church at weymouth the good father performed the ceremony and nearly broke down during it they say and then he kissed both bride and groom the neighbors had repaired to the parsonage and were eating and drinking and making merry when john and abigail slipped out by the back gate and made their way hand in hand in the starlight down the road and ran through the woods to braintree when near the village they cut across the pasture lot and reached their cottage which for several weeks they had been putting in order john unlocked the front door and they entered over the big flat stone at the entry and over which you may enter now all sunken and worn by generations of men gone some whose feet have pressed that doorstep we count as a salt of the earth for their names are written large on history's page washington rode out there on horseback and while his aide held his horse he visited and drank mulled cider and ate doughnuts within. Hancock came often, and Otis, Samuel Adams, and Loring used to enter without plying the knocker. Through the earnest work of William G. Spear, the cottage has now been restored and fully furnished, as near like it was then, as knowledge, fancy, and imagination can devise. When we reached Quincy, we saw a benevolent-looking old Puritan, and June said, Ask him. "'Can you tell me where we can find Mr. Spear, the antiquarian?' I inquired. "'The which?' said the son of Priscilla Mullins. "'Mr. Spear, the antiquarian,' I repeated. "'It's not Bill Spear, who keeps a second-hand shop you want, maybe?' "'Yes, I think that is the man.' And so we were directed to the, quote, second-hand shop, end quote, which proved to be the rooms of the Quincy Historical Society. And there we saw such a wondrous collection of second-hand stuff that as we looked and looked and mr spear explained and gave large slices of colonial history june who is a daughter of the american revolution gushed a trifle more than was meet nothing short of a hundred years will set the seal of value on an article for mr spear and one hundred fifty is more like it on his walls are hats caps spurs boots and accoutrements used in the revolutionary war then there are candlesticks, snuffers, spectacles, butter moulds, bonnets, dresses, shoes, baby stockings, cradles, rattles, aprons, butter tubs made out of a solid piece, shovels to match, andirons, pokers, skillets, and blue china galore. Bill Spear himself is quite a curiosity. He traces a lineage to the well-known lieutenant Seth Spear of revolutionary fame, and back of that to John Alden, who spoke for himself. The bark on the antiquarian is rather rough, 
and I regret to say that he makes use of a few words I cannot find in the Century Dictionary, but as June was not shocked, I managed to stand it. On further acquaintance, I concluded that Mr. Spears' brusqueness was assumed, and that, beneath the tough husk, there beats a very tender heart. He is one of those queer fellows who do good by stealth, and abuse you roundly if accused of it. For twenty-five years, Mr. Spear has been doing little else but studying colonial history and making love to old ladies who own clocks and skillets given them by their great-grandmamas. There is no doubt that Spear has dictated clauses in a hundred wills devising that William G. Spear, custodian of the Quincy Historical Society, shall have snuffers and biscuit moulds. At first, Mr. Spear collected for his own amusement and benefit, but the trouble grew upon him until it became chronic, and one fine day he realized that he was not immortal, and when he should die, all his collection, which had taken years to accumulate, would be scattered. And so he founded the Quincy Historical Society, incorporated by a perpetual charter with Charles Francis Adams, grandson of John Quincy Adams, as first president. Then the next thing was to secure the cottage where John and Abigail Adams began housekeeping, and where John Quincy was born. This house has been in the Adams family all these years, and been rented to the firm of Tom, Dick, and Harry, and any of their tribe who would agree to pay ten dollars a month for its use and abuse. Just across the road from the cottage lives a fine old soul by the name of John Crane. Mr. Crane is somewhere between seventy and a hundred years old, but he has a young heart, a face like Gladstone, and a memory like a copy book. Mr. Crane was on very good terms with John Quincy Adams, knew him well, and had often seen him come here to collect rent. He told me that during his recollection, the Adams place had been occupied by full forty families, but now, thanks to Bill Spear, it is no longer for rent. The house has been raised from the ground, new sills placed under it, and while every part, scantling, rafter, joist, cross-beam, lath, and weatherboard of the original house has been retained, it has been put in such order that it is no longer going to ruin. From the ample stores of his various antiquarian depositories, Mr. Spear has refurnished it, and with a ripe knowledge and rare good taste and restraining imagination, the cottage is now shown to us as a colonial farmhouse of the year 1750. The wonder to me is that Mr. Spear, being human, did not move his, quote, second-hand shop, end quote, down here and make of the place a curiosity shop. But he has done better. End of section 12section 13 of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by s k edison new jersey little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by albert hubbard section 13 john quincy adams part 2 as you step across the door sill and pass from the little entry into the living room, you pause and murmur, Excuse me? For there is a fire on the hearth, the tea kettle sings softly, and on the back of a chair hangs a sunbonnet. And over there on the table is an open Bible, and on the open page is a pair of spectacles and a red crumpled handkerchief. Yes, the folks are at home. They have just stepped into the next room, perhaps are eating dinner. And so you sit down in an old hickory chair, or in the high settle that stands against the wall by the fireplace, and wait, expecting every moment that the kitchen door will creak on its wooden hinges, and Abigail, smiling and gentle, will enter to greet you. Mr. Spear understands, and, disappearing, leaves you to your thoughts and June's. John and Abigail were lovers their lifetime through. Their published letters show a oneness of thought and sentiment that, viewed across the years, moves us to tears to think that such as they should at last feebly totter and then turn to dust. But here they came in joyous springtime of their lives. Upon this floor you tread the ways their feet have trod. These walls have a code to their singing voices, listened to their counsels, and seen love's caress. There is no surplus furniture, nor display, nor setting forth of useless things. Every article you see has its use. 
the little shelf of books well thumbed displays no trilby nor quest for the golden girl not an anachronism anywhere curtains chairs tables and the one or two pictures all ring true in the kitchen are wash tubs and butter ladles and bowls and the lantern hanging by the chimney with a dipped candle inside has a carefully scraped horn face it is a lantern in the cupboard across the corner are blue china and pewter spoons and steel knives with just a little polished brass stuff sent from england down in the cellar with its dirt walls are apples yellow pumpkins and potatoes each in its proper place for abigail was a rare good housekeeper then there is a barrel of cider with a hickory spigot and an inviting gourd all tells of economy thrift industry and the cunning of women's hands in the kitchen there is a funny cradle hooded and cut out of a great pine log the little mattress and the coverlet seem disturbed and you would declare the baby had just been lifted out and you listen for its cry the rocker is worn by the feet of mothers whose hands were busy with needles or wheel as they rocked and sang and from the fact that it is in the kitchen you know that the servant girl problem then had no terrors overhead hang ears of corn bunches of dried catnip pennyroyal and boneset and festooned across the corner are strings of dried apples then you go upstairs with conscience pricking a bit for thus visiting the house of honest folks when they are away for you know how all good housewives dislike to have people prying about especially in the upper chambers at least june said so the room to the right was abigail's own you would know it was a woman's room there is a faint odor of lavender and thyme about it and the white and blue draperies round the little mirror and the little feminine nothings on the dresser reveal the lady who would appear well before the man she loves the bed is a high draped four-poster plain and solid evidently made by a ship carpenter who had ambitions the coverlet is light blue and matches the draperies of windows dresser and mirror on the pillow is a nightcap in which even a homely woman would be beautiful there is a clothes press in the corner into which mr spear says we may look on the door is a slippery elm button and within hanging on wooden pegs are dainty dresses stiff curiously embroidered gowns they are that came from across the sea sent perhaps by john adams when he went to france and left abigail here to farm and sew and weave and teach the children june examined the dresses carefully and said the embroidery was handmade and must have taken monks and monks to complete on a high shelf of the closet are bandboxes in which are bonnets astonishing bonnets with prodigious flaring fronts mr spear insisted that june should try one on and when she did we stood off and declared the effect was a vision of loveliness outside the clothes press on a peg hangs a linsey woolsey everyday gown that shows marks of wear the waist came just under june's arms and the bottom of the dress to her shoe tops we asked mr spear the price of it but the custodian is not commercial in a corner of the room is a cedar chest containing hand-woven linen by the front window is a little low desk with a leaf that opens out for a writing shelf and here you see quill pens fresh nibbed and ink in a curious well made from horn here it was that abigail wrote those letters to her lover husband when he attended those first and second congresses in philadelphia and then when he was in france and england those letters in which we see affection loyalty tales of babies with colic brave political good sense and all those foolish trifles that go to fill up love letters and at the last are their divine essence and charm here she wrote the letter telling of going with their seven-year-old boy john quincy to penn's hill to watch the burning of charlestown and saw the flashing of cannons and rising smoke that marked the battle of bunker hill here she wrote to her husband when he was minister to england quote, this little cottage has more comfort and satisfaction for you than the courts of royalty End quote. but of all the letters written by that brave woman none reveals her true nobility better than the one written to her husband the day he became president of the united states here it is entire quincy 8th february 1797 the sun is dressed in brightest beams to give thy honors to the day and it may prove an auspicious prelude to each ensuing season you have this day to declare yourself head of a nation and now o lord my god 
thou hast made thy servant ruler over the people give unto him an understanding heart that he may know how to go out and come in before this great people that he may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people where the words of a royal sovereign and not less applicable to him who is invested with the chief magistracy of a nation though he wear not a crown nor the robes of royalty my thoughts and my meditations are with you though personally absent and my petitions to heaven are that the things which make for peace may not be hidden from your eyes my feelings are not those of pride or ostentation upon the occasion they are solemnized by a sense of obligations the important trusts and numerous duties connected with it that you may be enabled to discharge them with honor to yourself with justice and impartiality to your country and with satisfaction to this great people shall be the daily prayer of your abigail it was in this room that abigail waited while british soldiers ransacked the rooms below and made bullets of the best pewter spoons here her son who was to be president was born john quincy adams was six years old when his father kissed him good-bye and rode away for philadelphia with john hancock and samuel adams who rode a horse loaned him by john adams abigail stood in the doorway holding the baby and watched them disappear in the curve of the road this was in august seventeen hundred seventy four most of the rest of that year abigail was alone with her babies on the little farm it was the same next year and in seventeen hundred seventy six too when john adams wrote home that he had made the formal move for independency and also nominated george washington as commander-in-chief of the army and he hoped things would soon be better those were troublous times in which to live in the vicinity of boston there were straggling troops passing up and down the plymouth road every day sometimes there were red coats and sometimes buff and blue but all seemed to be very hungry and extremely thirsty and the adams household received a great deal more attention than it quoted the master of the house was away but all seemed to know who lived there and the callers were not always courteous in such feverish atmosphere of unrest children evolve quickly into men and women and their faces take on the look of thought where should be only careless happy dimpled smiles yes responsibility matures and that is the way john quincy adams got cheated out of his childhood when eight years of age his mother called him the little man of the house the next year he was a post rider making a daily trip to boston with letter bags across his saddle bows when eleven years of age his father came home to say that someone had to go to france to serve with jay and franklin in making a treaty go said abigail and god be with you but when it was suggested that john quincy go too the parting did not seem so easy but it was a fine opportunity for the boy to see the world of men and the mother's head appreciated it even if her heart did not and yet she had the heroism that is willing to remain behind so father and son sailed away the little john quincy added postscripts to his father's letters and said quote, i send my loving duty to my mamma the boy took kindly to foreign ways as boys will and the french language had no such terrors for him as it had for his father the first stay in europe was only three months and back they came on a leaky ship but the home stay was even shorter than the stay abroad and john adams had again to cross the water on his country's business again the boy went with him it was five years before the mother saw him and then he had gone on alone from paris to london to meet her she did not know him for he was nearly eighteen and a man grown he had visited every country in europe and been the helper and companion of statesmen and courtiers and seen society in its various faces he spoke several languages and in point of polish and manly dignity was a peer of many of his elders mrs adams looked at him and then began to cry whether for joy or for sorrow she did not know her boy had gone escaped her gone forever but instead there was a tall young diplomat calling her mother there was a courier ahead of john quincy adams his father knew it his mother was sure of it and john quincy himself was not in doubt he could then have gone right on but his father was a harvard man and the new england superstition was strong in the adams heart that success could only be achieved when based on a harvard parchment 
So back to Massachusetts sailed John Quincy, and a two-year course at Harvard secured the much-desired diploma. From the very time he crawled over his kitchen floor and pushed a chair, learning to walk, or tumbled down the stairs and then made his way bravely up again alone, he knew that he would arrive. Precautious, proud, firm, and with a coldness in his nature that was not a heritage from either his father or his mother, he made his way. It was a zigzag course, and the way was strewn with the flotsam and jetsam of wrecked parties and blighted hopes, but out of the wreckage John Quincy Adams always appeared, calm, poised, and serene. When he opposed the purchase of Louisiana, it looks as if he allowed his animosity for Jefferson to put his judgment in chancery. He made mistakes, but this was the only blunder of his career. The record of that life, expressed in bold, stands thus. 1767, born May 11th. 1776, post rider between Boston and Quincy. 1778, at school in Paris. 1780, at school in Leyden. 1781, private secretary to minister to Russia. 1787, graduated at Harvard. 1794, minister at The Hague. 1797, married Louise Catherine Johnson of Maryland. 1797, minister at Berlin. 1802, member of Massachusetts State Senate. 1803, United States Senator. 1806, Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory at Harvard. 1809, Minister to Russia. 1811, nominated and confirmed by Senate as Judge of Supreme Court of the United States. Declined. 1814, Commissioner at Ghent to treat for peace with Great Britain. 1815, Minister to Great Britain. 1817, Secretary of State. 1825, elected President of the United States, 1830, elected a member of Congress and represented the district for 17 years, 1848, stricken with paralysis, February 21st in the capital, and died the second day after. Aren't we staying in this room a good while? said June. You have sat there staring out of that window looking at nothing for just ten minutes, and not a word have you spoken. Mr. Spear had disappeared into space, and so we made our way across the little hall to the room that belonged to Mr. Adams. It was in the disorder that men's rooms are apt to be. On the table were quill pens and curious old papers with seals on them, and on one I saw the date, June 16, 1768, the whole document written out in the hand of John Adams, beginning very prim and careful, then moving off into a hurried scrawl as spirit mastered the letter. There is a little hair-covered trunk in the corner, studded with brass nails, and boots and leggings and canes, and a jackknife, and a boot-jack, and, on the window-sill, a friendly snuff-box. In the clothes-press were buff trousers, and an embroidered coat, and shoes with silver buckles, and several suits of everyday clothes showing wear and patches. On up to the garret we groped, and bumped our heads against the rafters. The light was dim, but we could make out more apples and strings, and roots and herbs in bunches hung from the peak. Here there was a three-legged chair, and a broken spinning wheel, and the junk that is too valuable to throw away, yet not too good enough to keep, but, quote, some day may be needed, end quote. Down the narrow stairway we went, and in the little kitchen, Sammy, the artist, and Mr. Spear, the custodian, were busy at the fireplace preparing dinner. There is no starve in the house, and none is needed. The crane and brick oven and long-handled skillets suffice. Sammy is an expert camp cook, and swears there is death in the chafing dish, and grows profane if you mention one. His skill in turning flapjacks by the simple manipulation of the long-handled griddle means more to his true ego than the finest canvas. June offered to set the table, but Sammy said she could never do it alone, so together they brought out the blue china dishes and the pewter plates. Then they drew water at the stone-curbed well with the great sweep, carrying the leather-bailed bucket between them. I was feeling quite useless and asked, Can't I do something to help? There is the lye leech. You might bring out some ashes and make some soft soap, said June, pointing to the ancient leech and soap kettle in the yard, the joys of Mr. Spear's heart. 
Sammy stood at the back door and pounded on the dishpan with a wooden spoon to announce that dinner was ready. It was quite a sumptuous meal, potatoes baked in the ashes, beans baked in the brick oven, coffee made on the hearth, fish cooked in the skillet, and pancakes made on a griddle with a handle three feet long. Mr. Spear had aspirations toward an apple pie, and had made violent efforts in that direction, but the product being dough on top and charcoal on the bottom, we declined the nomination with thanks. June suggested that pies should be baked in an oven and not cooked on a pancake griddle. The custodian thought there might be something in it, a suggestion he would have scorned and scouted had it come from me. To change the rather painful subject, Mr. Spear began to talk about John and Abigail Adams, and to quote from their letters a volume he seems to have by heart. Do you know why their love was so very steadfast, and why they stimulated the mental and spiritual natures of each other so? asked June. No. Why was it? Well, I'll tell you. It was because they spent one-third of their married life apart. Indeed. Yes. And in this way they lived in an ideal world. In all their letters, you see they are always counting the days ere they will meet. Now, people who are together all the time never write that way, because they do not feel that way. I leave it to Mr. Spear. But Mr. Spear, being a bachelor, did not know. Then the case was referred to Sammy, and Sammy lied and said he had never considered the subject. And would you advise, then, that married couples live apart one-third of the time in the interests of domestic peace? I asked. Certainly, said June, with her Burne Jones chin in the air. Certainly, but I fear you are the man who does not understand, and anyway I am sure it will be much more profitable for us to cultivate the receptive spirit and listen to Mr. Spear. Such opportunities do not come very often. I did not mean to interrupt you, Mr. Spear. Go on, please. And Mr. Spear filled a clay pipe with natural leaf that he crumbled in his hand, and deftly picking a coal from the fireplace with a shovel one hundred fifty years old, puffed five times silently and began to talk. End of section 13section 14 of little journeys to the homes of american statesmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b little journeys to the homes of american statesmen by elbert hubbard alexander hamilton the objects to be attained are to justify and preserve the confidence of the most enlightened friends of good government, to promote the increasing respectability of the American name, to answer the calls of justice, to restore landed property to its due value, to furnish new sources both to agriculture and to commerce, to cement more closely the union of the states, to add to their security against foreign attack, to establish public order on the basis of an upright and liberal policy these are the great and invaluable ends to be secured by a proper and adequate provision at the present period for the support of public credit report to congress we do not know the name of the mother of alexander hamilton we do not know the given name of his father but from letters a diary and pieced out reports allowing fancy to bridge from fact to fact we get a patchwork history of the events preceding the birth of this wonderful man every strong man has had a splendid mother hamilton's mother was a woman of wit beauty and education while very young through the machinations of her elders she had been married to a man much older than herself rich willful and dissipated the man's name was levine but his first name we do not know so hidden were the times and a maze of obscurity the young wife very soon discovered the depravity of this man whom she had vowed to love and obey divorce was impossible and rather than endure a lifelong existence of legalized shame she packed up her scanty effects and sought to hide herself from society and kinsmen by going to the west indies there she hoped to find employment as a governess in the family of one of the rich planters or if this plan were not successful she would start a school on her own account 
and thus benefit her kind and make for herself an honorable living arriving at the island of nevis she found that the natives did not especially desire education certainly not enough to pay for it and there was no family requiring a governess but a certain scotch planner by the name of hamilton who was consulted thought in time that a school could be built up and he offered to meet the expense of it until such a time as it could be put on a paying basis unmarried women who accept friendly loans from men stand in dangerous places with all good women heart whole gratitude and a friendship that seems unselfish ripen easily into love they did so here perhaps in a warm ardent temperament sore grief and biting disappointment and crouching want obscure the judgment and give a show of reason to actions that a colder intellect would disapprove on the frontiers of civilization man is greater than law all ceremonies are looked upon lightly in a few months mrs levine was called by the little world of nevis mrs hamilton and mr and mrs hamilton regarded themselves as man and wife the planter hamilton was a hard-headed busy individual who was quite unable to sympathize with his wife's finer aspirations her first husband had been clever and dissipated this one was worthy and dull and thus deprived of congenial friendships without books or art or that social home life which goes to make up a woman's world and longing for the safety of close sympathy and tender love with no one on whom her intellect could strike a spark she keenly felt the bitterness of exile in a city where society ebbs and flows an intellectual woman married to a commerce scrubbing man is not especially to be pitied she can find intellectual affinities that will ease the irksomeness of her situation but to be cast on a desert isle with a being no matter how good who is incapable of feeling with you the eternal mystery of the encircling tides who can only stare when you speak of the moaning lullaby of the restless sea who knows not the glory of the sunrise and feels no thrill when the breakers dash themselves into foam or the moonlight dances on the phosphorescent waves ah that is indeed exile loneliness is not in being alone for then ministering spirits come to soothe and bless loneliness is to endure the presence of one who does not understand and so this finely organized receptive aspiring woman through the exercise of a will that seemed masculine in its strength found her feet mired in quicksand she struggled to free herself and every effort only sank her deeper the relentless environment only held her with firmer clutch she thirsted for knowledge for sweet music for beauty for sympathy for attainment she had a heart hunger that none about her understood she strove for better things she prayed to god but the heavens were as brass she cried aloud and the only answer was the throbbing of her restless heart in this condition a son was born to her they called his name alexander hamilton this child was heir to all his mother's splendid ambitions her lack of opportunity was his blessing for the stifled aspirations of her soul charged his being with a strong man's desires and all the mother's silken unswerving will was woven through his nature he was to surmount obstacles that she could not overcome and to tread under his feet difficulties that to her were invincible the prayer of her heart was answered but not in the way she expected god listened to her after all for every earnest prayer has its answer and not a sincere desire of the heart but somewhere will find its gratification but earth's buffets were too severe for the brave young woman the forces in league against her were more than she could withstand and before her boy was out of baby dresses she gave up the struggle and went to her long rest soothed only by the thought that although she had sorely blundered she yet had done her work as best she could at his mother's death we find alexander hamilton taken in charge by certain mystical kinsmen evidently he was well cared for as he grew into a handsome strong lad small to be sure but finely formed where he learned to read write and cipher we know not 
he seems to have had one of those active alert minds that can acquire knowledge on a barren island when nine years old he signed his name as witness to a deed the signature is needlessly large and bold and written with careful schoolboy pains but the writing shows the same characteristics that mark the thousand and one dispatches which we have signed at bottom g washington at twelve years of age he was clerk in a general store one of those country stores where everything is kept from ribbon to whiskey there were other helpers in the store full grown but when the proprietor went away for a few days into the interior the dark slim youngster took charge of the bookkeeping and the cash and made such shrewd exchanges of merchandise for produce that when the old man returned the lad was rewarded by two pats on the head and a raise in salary of one shilling a week about this time the boy was also showing signs of literary skill by writing sundry poems and compositions and one of his efforts in this line describing a tropical hurricane was published in a london paper this opened the eyes of the mystical kinsmen to the fact that they had a genius among them and the elder hamilton was importuned for money to send the boy to boston that he might receive a proper education and come back and own the store and be a magistrate and a great man no doubt the lad pressed the issue too for his ambition had already begun to ferment as we find him writing to a friend i'll risk my life though not my character to exalt my station most great things in america have to take their rise in boston so it seems meet that alexander hamilton age fifteen a british subject should first set foot on american soil at long wharf boston he took a ferry over to cambridge port and walked through the woods three miles to harvard college possibly he did not remain because his training in a bookish way had not been sufficient for him to enter and possibly he did not like the puritanic visage of the old professor who greeted him on the threshold of massachusetts hall at any rate he soon made his way to new haven yale suited him no better and he took a boat for new york he had letters to several good clergymen in new york and they proved wise and good counselors the boy was advised to take a course at the grammar school at elizabethtown new jersey there he remained for a year applying himself most vigorously and the next fall he knocked at the gate of king's college it is called columbia now because kings in america went out of fashion and all honors formerly paid to the king were turned over to miss columbia goddess of freedom king's college swung wide its doors for the swarthy little west indian he was allowed to choose his own course and every advantage of the university was offered him in a university you get just all you are able to hold it depends upon yourself and at the last all men who are made at all are self-made hamilton improved each passing moment as it flew with the help of a tutor he threw himself into his work gathering up knowledge with the quick perception and eager alertness of one from whom the good things of earth have been withheld yet he lived well and spent his money as if there were plenty more where it came from but he was never dissipated nor wasteful this was in the year seventeen hundred seventy four and the colonies were in a state of political excitement young hamilton's sympathies were all with the mother country he looked upon the americans for the most part as a rude crude and barbaric people who should be very grateful for the protection of such an all-powerful country as england at his boarding-house and at school he argued the question hotly defending england's right to tax her dependencies one fine day one of his schoolmates put the question to him flatly in case of war on which side will you fight hamilton answered on the side of england but by the next day he had reasoned it out that if england succeeded in suppressing the rising insurrection she would take all credit to herself and if the colonies succeeded there would be honors for those who did the work suddenly it came over him that there was such a thing as the divine right of insurrection and that there was no reason why men living in america should be taxed to support a government across the sea the wealth produced in america 
should be used to develop america he was young and burning with a lofty ambition he knew and had known all along that he would some day be great and famous and powerful here was the opportunity and so next day he announced at the boarding-house that the eloquence and logic of his messmates were too powerful to resist he believed the colonies and the messmates were in the right then several bottles were brought in and success was drunk to all men who strove for liberty patriotic sentiment is at the last self-interest in fact herbert spencer declares that there is no sane thought or rational act but has its root in egoism shortly after the young man's conversion there was a mass meeting held in the fields which meant the wilds of what is now the region of twenty-third street young hamilton stood in the crowd and heard the various speakers plead the cause of the colonies and urged that new york should stand firm with massachusetts against the further encroachments and persecutions of england there were many tories in the crowd for new york was with king george as against massachusetts and these tories asked the speakers embarrassing questions that the speakers failed to answer and all the time young hamilton found himself nearer and nearer the platform finally he undertook to reply to a talkative tory and some one shouted give him the platform the platform and in a moment this seventeen-year-old boy found himself facing two thousand people there was hesitation and embarrassment but the shouts of one of his college chums give it to him give it to him filled in an awkward instant and he began to speak there was logic and lucidity of expression and as he talked the air became charged with reasons and all he had to do was to reach up and seize them his strong and passionate nature gave gravity to his sentences and every quibbling objector found himself answered and more than answered and the speakers who were to present the case found this stripling doing the work so much better than they could that they urged him on with applause and loud cries of bravo bravo immediately at the close of hamilton's speech the chairman had the good sense to declare the meeting adjourned thus shutting off all reply as well as closing the mouths of the minnow orators who usually pop up to neutralize the impression that the strong man has made hamilton's speech was the talk of the town the leading whigs sought him out and begged that he would write down his address so that they could print it as a pamphlet in reply to the tory pamphleteers who were vigorously circulating their wares the pens of ready writers were scarce in those days men could argue but to present a forcible written brief was another thing so young hamilton put his reasons on paper and their success surprised the boys at the boarding-house and the college chums and the professors and probably himself as well his name was on the lips of all wigdom and the tories sent messengers to buy him off but congress was willing to pay its defenders and money came from somewhere not much but all the young man needed college was dropped the political pot boiled and the study of history economics and statecraft filled the daylight hours to the brim and often ran over into the night the winter of seventeen hundred seventy five passed away the plot thickened new york had reluctantly consented to be represented in congress and agreed grumpily to join hands with the colonies the redcoats had marched out to concord and back and the embattled farmers had stood and fired the shot heard round the world hamilton was working hard to bring new york over to an understanding that she must stand firm against english rule he organized meetings gave addresses wrote letters newspaper articles and pamphlets then he joined a military company and was perfecting himself in the science of war there were frequent outbreaks between tory mobs and whigs and the breaking up of your opponent's meeting was looked upon as a pleasant pastime then came the british ship asia and opened fire on the town this no doubt made whigs of a good many tories whig sentiment was on the increase gangs of men marched through the streets and the king's stores were broken into and prominent royalists found their houses being threatened dr cooper president of king's college had been very pronounced in his rebukes to congress and the colonies 
and a mob made its way to his house arriving there hamilton and his chum troop were found on the steps determined to protect the place hamilton stepped forward and in a strong speech urged that dr cooper had merely expressed his own private views which he had a right to do and the house must not on any account be molested while the parley was in progress old dr cooper himself appeared at one of the upper windows and excitedly cautioned the crowd not to listen to that blatant young rapscallion hamilton as he was a rogue and a varlet and a vagrom the good doctor then slammed the window and escaped by the back way his remarks raised a laugh in which even young hamilton joined but his mistake was very natural in view of the fact that he only knew that hamilton had deserted the college and espoused the devil's cause and not having heard his remarks but seeing him standing on his steps haranguing a crowd thought surely he was endeavouring to work up mischief against his old preceptor who had once plucked him in greek it seems to have been the intention of his guardians that the limit of young hamilton's stay in america was to be two years and by that time his education would be complete and he would return to the west indies and surprise the natives but his father who supplied the money and the mystical kinsman who supplied advice and the kind friends who had given him letters to the presbyterian clergymen at new york and princeton had figured without their host young hamilton knew all that nevis had in store for him he knew its littleness its contumely and disgrace and in the secret recesses of his own strong heart he had slipped the cable that held him to the past no more remittances from home no more solicitous advice no more kind loving letters the past was dead for england he once had had an almost idolatrous regard to him she had once been the protector of his native land the empress of the seas the enlightener of mankind but henceforth he was an american he was to fight america's battles to share in her victory to help make of her a great nation and to weave his name into the web of her history so that as long as the united states of america shall be remembered so long also shall be remembered the name of alexander hamilton what general washington called his family usually consisted of sixteen men these were his aides and more than that his counsellors and friends in washington's frequent use of that expression my family there is a touch of affection that we do not expect to find in the tents of war in rank the staff ran the gamut from captain to general each man had his appointed work and made a daily report to his chief when not in actual action the family dined together daily and the affair was conducted with considerable ceremony washington sat at the head of the table large handsome and dignified at his right hand was seated the guest of honor and there were usually several invited friends at his left sat alexander hamilton ready with quick pen to record the orders of his chief and methinks it would have been quite worth while to have had a place at that board and looked down the table at the strong fine face tinged with melancholy of washington and the cheery youthful faces of lawrence tillman lee aaron burr alexander hamilton and the others of that brave and handsome company well might they have called washington father for this he was in spirit to them all grave gentle courteous and magnanimous yet exacting strict and instant obedience from all and well too may we imagine that this obedience was freely and cheerfully given end of section fourteen